Well, good morning. Good morning again. We are about to wrap up this series called Who is Jesus? And uh, much like this morning, uh, we sang that song, Jaira. Has anybody ever heard that word before? Have you ever heard the word Jaira? Um, uh, it's, a, it's another um, name that really is an indicator of who God is, not just his aim, but who he is, what he does. And uh, the same goes for Jesus. Jesus, um, as we've been talking about over the last number of weeks, has a number of names uh, that um, we see um, throughout uh, the scriptures as uh, we read about his life and his ministry um, in the Gospels of the New Testament. And so um, I just want to remind you uh, that uh, feel free to take notes as we continue through this series. And uh, if there's something you hear that uh, really strikes you, just write that down, keep a note of it. Um, I'm going to start with a story that I'm pretty sure about 50% of you are probably going to check out on. But there may be more of you check out on because it's about the Chicago Cubs. So I offer my apology in advance of starting with this bit of an introduction to this last message about Jesus, who is also known as the Son of God. So for those of you who have fond memories of this, uh, it was the seventh inning of Game 7 of the 2016 World Series. Yeah, you know what happened in 2016, don't you? 2016 World Series. The Chicago Cubs were leading 6-3, to three, and they were bringing in their ace relief pitcher, um, Ardolis Chapman. And he was going to get the final out and seal the victory for the Chicago Cubs. And what would that do? It would what? It would break their what? You remember what that's called? The Chicago Cub curse, right? And the Indians doubled, then they hit a two-run home run, and all of a sudden, the game was 6-6. Six to six. I don't know if any of you remember that, but Cleveland had the momentum, and all of the faithful Cubby fans were like, oh no, here's where the wheels fall off, and the what is still alive? The curse. It was still alive. And invigorated but inspired by a fresh dose of the truth, the Cubbies then rallied for two go-ahead runs in the top of the 10th inning. Now, the Cubs could have accepted what looked like an inevitable defeat, but instead, they charged ahead. They were fueled by the truth of who they were, and they were going to win their World Series, their first World Series in 108 years. 108 years old, 108 years. Man, that's, that's longer than Dave Millard's been around. 108 years they were going to win their first World Series. But then, I don't know how many of you are watching this game, but something happened at that point. It began to rain. It began to rain. And Progressive Field had to shut down. They rolled out the rain tarp, and they forced the players, the managers, and the fans to all wait for the 10th inning of the tie game because the Cubs were up in the top of the inning, but who has the bottom? Which team? The home team has the bottom of the inning. So sensing that the team was deflated, maybe even defeated, Cubs right fielder, Jason Hayward, he called the team together passionately and he exhorted them, remember who you are, remember who you are. He, he, he reminded the Cubs of their identity as the best regular season team that year. They were victors in two other rounds of the playoffs and a team that came back from a three games to one deficit in order to force a game seven. He reminded them that it was their game to win as much as it was to lose he reminded them of who they were, remembering who they were, remembering who you are, holding tight to our identity. The truth of being certain of our identity is a critical, especially when all else seems to be out of control and something we can take comfort in when we need to. And I often wonder, I often wonder how Jesus, also known as the Son of God, managed to do that in the midst of the storm that he walked through in his earthly ministry and life. Jesus was known as the Son of God, and he tells us himself, he tells us himself that he 
and the Father were uniquely one. Jesus says that He and the Father were uniquely one. In the pages of the New Testament, we often see Jesus refer to kind of this oneness or this specialness of His relationship with God. In John's Gospel, in chapter 5, verse 15, 16 through 18, we, we read these words. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father's always at his work to this very day, and I, too, am working for this reason. The Jews tried all the harder to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? Equal with God. The fact is, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were scandalized by the fact that Jesus claimed this unique relationship with God the Father. You can witness the response of the religious leaders when Jesus talked about this. They wanted to kill him. In the culture that Jesus grew up in, to be called the son of, indicated to those around you, those who knew you, that you were kind of made of the same stuff that which you were the son of. And again, in John's Gospel, Jesus talks about this relationship that he has with the Father. Over in chapter 10, Jews, the Jews gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones uh, to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of those, <laughs> replied the Jews. No, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. In many ways, friends, this is what still irks people, even in our day and age, that we in the church, we would claim that Jesus is the only Son of God, that Jesus is God's only Son, that Jesus and God are the same person. For in our culture, that's a bit too restrictive. After all, aren't all religions the same? There isn't really anything all that unique about Jesus. There have been many famous deaths in the world, haven't there? Uh, you've probably heard of the tragic deaths of, like, John F. Kennedy. Or even uh, go further back in history, uh, Marie Antoinette. Or, or even Cleopatra. But we don't refer to the assassination, the guillotine, or the poisoning. Such references, they would be really incomprehensible. The use of the term, the crucifixion, for the execution of Jesus shows that it still retains kind of this unique status. When we speak of the crucifixion, even in our secular age, many people, many people will still know what we're talking about. There is something in the strange death of the man identified as the Son of God that continues to kind of command special attention. This death, this execution, Above and beyond all others, it continues to kind of have this universal reverberation. Of no other death in human history can this be said. The cross of Jesus stands alone in this regard. And you know what? There were many thousands of crucifixion in Roman times. But only the crucifixion of Jesus is remembered as having any significance at all, let alone world-transforming significance. The real problem, the real problem, folks, is that Jesus is in fact extraordinarily different, extraordinarily unique. And again, 
in the Gospel of John, you can read the words that are used in John chapter 1, verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 18, John chapter 3, verse 16 and 18. These are some key verses. And we may have even heard or memorized some of those verses of Scripture that speak of Jesus as being the only begotten Son. But a more correct way of saying that Greek word, monogenes, in English, is that Jesus is uniquely God's son, and that his relationship with the Father is like none other. Jesus is the son of God. He tells us that he is. He says that he and the Father are uniquely one. In addition, since Jesus is called the son of God, there's something else we need to understand that is significant, and this is it. Jesus said that his Father sent him to us. Perhaps the biblical account that best illustrates that is found in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. Jesus went on to tell the people this parable. He said this, A man planted a vineyard, and he rented it to some, father, some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they could give him some of the fruit of the vineyard, but the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Have you ever heard this, you ever heard this account from the gospel? Uh, he sent another servant. But that one they also beat and treated shamefully. Sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. The vineyard owner in that parable represents God. The tenants, the ones who are responsible for the upkeep of the property, those are the religious leaders of Jesus' day. It's their responsibility to look after the property until the owner, God, comes back to claim his portion of the vineyard's fruit. And instead, what do we see? Even after the owner sends personal envoys to the vineyard who are attacked and beat up, there's this incredible patience on the part of the owner. So much, son, so much so, he decides to send whom? He sent his own son. He sends Jesus. And the text says this. I love what we read in the text, which is, I will send my son whom what? I love. And that, that has to also say something about the vineyard owner and how he loves those of us who are in his vineyard. That after all has happened, after all that's occurred, he decides he's going to get really personal with us. One of my favorite writers, authors, and speakers when I did youth ministry, you may have heard this name, was a guy by the name of Mike Iaconelli. And Mike, uh, in his work with youth and youth ministries, uh, has been tremendous. But one of the things that I've appreciated the most about the life and the story of Mike Iaconelli was his honesty. And it was painfully honest about his own spiritual struggles, trying to measure up to God's love. And he did an interview um, quite a few years ago with Christianity Today uh, with a gentleman named Dick Staub. I don't know if you've ever heard that name. Dick Staub used to be a radio uh, host for Moody uh, Bible uh, Radio. And um, here's what Mike said in that interview. He says, I travel a lot and I came to San Francisco one night and I missed my connection back home. I was angry and upset and I called my son on the phone. I wanted him to encourage me. I said, man... I'm stuck in an airport. It's been such a horrible day. I've been traveling too much. And my son said, you know, Dad, if you didn't travel so much, you wouldn't have things like that happen. Well, I didn't appreciate that, and it ticked me off. I said, well, let me talk to your son, my, my two-year-old grandson. Well, I forgot that when you're two, you can't really talk, and when you're 60, you can't really hear. That's not a good combination. 
And so he's mumbling on the phone. I'm hoping that this is going to make me feel better. It's actually making me feel worse. Finally, I've had it. I hear the phone drop to the floor. Now I hear the kids playing in the background. I'm stuck in the airport. I'm having this miserable experience. I'm furious and angry. When all of a sudden I hear crystal clear over the phone, I love you, Grandpa. You know what? All my anxiety, everything went out of the window. There are people who are so busy, they're at their wit's end. If they'd only stop for a minute, they'd hear the God of the universe whisper to them, I love you. And that's what it means when Jesus tells us his Father sent him to us. This is what it means that Jesus is the Son of God, that God took time and effort amid our running in every other direction, but toward him that he sent his one and only unique Son to tell us, how much he loves us. Finally, here's the third thing I want you to know. Jesus said that his father was now our father. You know, I grew up not having a personal relationship with my own father. And that uniquely impacted my view of what a father is. I don't have memories of games or events that we attended together. I can't recall great times that we spent together laughing, wrestling, kind of hanging out. I know that my father has other children, half-brothers and sisters of mine. I actually know where he lived and that recently he passed away. I won't lie. It was difficult as I grew up not knowing my father, not having a personal relationship with my father. Some of you in this room know what that's like. Some of our children who are here Maybe down the hall, they know what that feels like. But one thing I have indeed taken a great deal of comfort is, is in this. As a believer in Christ, my relationship with God the Father allows me to call him Father. Or as Jesus referred to him, Abba, which in the language of Jesus' day, Aramaic, Abba means Daddy. And whenever Jesus spoke with God the Father, the word he used to address him was this word, Abba. Every time Jesus talks with God in the Gospels of the New Testament, he refers to God as Father, more likely as Abba. With the exception of one quote in Matthew 27, 46, when he speaks from Psalm 22. Do you know what happens in that particular chapter? Jesus is on the cross. He cries what? He says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus, the Son of God, addresses God the Father as Abba, he's telling us something significant about his relationship with God. The Jews of Jesus' day would have never, ever called God Abba. It was, in a word, inconceivable. Nowhere in the vast writings of Jewish literature is there any reference to addressing God as Abba. But what does Jesus tell us to do when we pray? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, we are to pray by addressing God as what? Our what? Our Father. We are now His children. Because of His unique sons making that relationship come to us, we can now call God the Father, Abba. The Apostle Paul explains to the church in Rome. He says this in Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Apostle John, who was around Jesus when Jesus was teaching for the three years across the countryside, he writes and addresses this issue as well. In 1 John, we heard it this morning, See what great love, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called 
children of God. And that is what we are. Mr. Roten. Mr. Roden was a teacher and a coach in my junior high. I went to Black Hawk Junior High, home of the Braves. Yeah, we are were, we were something. But Mr. Roten was really interested in his students. And most people back then would have looked at me, preteen, fatherless, little black, scrawny little kid, and thought, no way that kid's going to make it. The truth is, I probably would have believed them too had Mr. Roten not made a difference with an incredible act of kindness. Every day at the end of basketball tryouts and after showers, after showers, remember this is junior high, so showers is more of an idea than you know, something they do. After showers were taken, what you could do is you could go out uh, to the coach's office um, and find out who was invited back the next day by looking at the list. Does this sound familiar to anybody when you try out for sports? You go check the list, see if you're on the list. Hey, I can come back the next day. And I made it through all three days of tryouts. Got to Friday. And Friday was the final day. That's when you found out who was on the team. And the list was posted for those who were invited back to be there on Monday. Guess what? My name wasn't on the list. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate this 40 years later. Thank you. And I cried all the way home. Now, back in those days, kids, uh, you walked everywhere. (laughs) So I had a long walk home, right? I cried all the way home. And it just so happened that the basketball coach drove by me as I was walking home and could see me crying. And I tried to, you know, turn my face and and hide my tears from him. But uh, on Monday, Mr. Roten asked me to stick around for the first day of basketball team practice. I was like, okay. And at the end of practice, he gathered everyone around himself for a moment. And he asked if anyone had noticed that I was in practice, even though my name had not appeared on the final cuts list from Friday. And he went on to explain that I was asked to stick around because, as he continued, after our last day of tryouts, he had been driving home and drove past me. He then told this group of preteen, pubescent, junior high boys, that he had seen me crying (laughs) as I was walking home from tryouts that day. And of course, the response, predictable, right? (laughs) You know, laughing, giggling, snickering, and it seemed to last forever. Then Mr. Roten followed that up with a statement, as best I can remember, something like this. He said, I asked Robbie, now listen to me, Mr. Roten calls me Robbie, okay? Y'all don't call me Robbie, okay? Mr. Roten said, I asked Robbie to come to practice today, and I want him to be on this team because any guy who wants so badly to be part of this team that he would cry because he wasn't, I figure we can't be without him on our team. Folks, to know that that was the connection that I made with him, changed my life forever. Who is this Jesus? Well, (laughs) because he's the son of God. He's uniquely one with God. Because his father sent him. Because his father is now our father. We're part of God's family. Not because... We chose him, but just like Mr. Roten chose me that day, it's because God has chosen us. That's what it means to know him as a son of God. He's our Abba. He's our Father.